Thank you, Chris, and thank you for your hospitality at this event. It's been awesome. Thank you to everybody from the Chaos Group. Uh, it's been an incredible uh, uh, day of, of activities. And also, thank you. Um, I am in awe of you. This is an amazing time to be an artist or a geek or an artist-geek hybrid, and everyone in this room is somewhere along that, uh, that continuum. Uh, I, am, uh, I am honored to be uh, with you at this conference, and thank you for taking the time to, to dive deep into what we call hyperscale um, uh, VR. So I will start by saying, you know, we, we have been uh, tracking AR and VR for a while in this industry, and one would be forgiven to think of VR and AR as just two more stops on this continuum of computing technologies. Um, and uh, in fact, I, um, a, a lot of people ask the question, um, are you still bullish about AR and VR technology? To which I say, more so now than ever. In fact, I don't think that it's just another stop in this continuum. I actually think of it in a more powerful way that there's a bunch of two-dimensional technologies and then there's new three-dimensional immersive technologies. So I would actually flatten the entire continuum of computing into these two phases instead of these discrete phases. Um, you know, it's interesting, my, um, as, as hard as it is for me to explain to my six-year-old daughter that once upon a time you had to make a phone call with a device that was plugged into the wall, um, like she just can't even process that. I mean, it will be way harder for her to explain to her kids that once upon a time, all of our digital information was presented to us in these silly rectangular slabs of glass and silicon. We're at this moment in time where the computing is quite literally spilling out of the screen and into the world around us in an incredibly exciting way. Now, these immersive devices, this five minutes, um, are, are very much kind of designed by geeks for geeks. Um, however, I think we're on the precipice of a revolution in that as well. So the first thing I would say is that even in the continuum between VR and AR, it's my belief that very soon, as transparent displays increase in field of view and fidelity, um, very soon th there will be no VR. In fact, I think all of VR will be a footnote on the Wikipedia page about AR. It will all be AR, and it's not going to look like that. The HoloLens 2 is an amazing device, however, it's going to be you know, soon indistinguishable from the designer glasses that I'm wearing right now. Um, you know, Apple isn't hiring all these design executives and fashion executives to focus on wristwatches only. They see technology as a wearable experience. And so very, very soon, devices will be, uh, will be wearable. So I'm more bullish than ever about the transformative potential of, um, of uh, augmented reality technology and immersive computing technologies. Um, and in fact, this is just the continuum of computing. If you zoom out and think about it in the context of human communications, um, you know, I, I think it's not that much of an exaggeration to think of this revolution as kind of <laughs> human communication 7.0, right? So we went from having emotion, which, you know, predated this species even, um, into speaking, incredibly efficient method for communication, go species, to, you know, drawing and sculpture, uh, all the way into reading and writing, actual written language, then to, let's call it scaled transmissions, which is a tapestry of technology across a pretty wide time range, uh, all the way from smoke signals to printing to, um, to wire transmission. And then that leads us into, let's call it global internetworking, uh, standards for a persistent multi-user network. Um, and then this, this concept of true telepresence, of being able to actually teleport yourself into another location. And that will fundamentally change communications as much as it will computing. So a lot of people say, augmented reality, I mean, it's cool, I've been tracking it, but it just doesn't seem something that's relevant to me. And I'm here to tell you that, let's say in one to one and a half iPhone generations from now, so let's call it 10 to 15 years from now, most people won't have a cell phone. And I know that's a ridiculous thing to say. In fact, I, when I was at Microsoft Research, I used to stand on stage 15 years ago and say, 15 years from now, your laptop will not be your com primary computing device. And that was controversial at the time. It's not at all controversial. So today I'm here to tell you that 15 years from now, your primary computing device will likely be contact lenses or, or eyewear. 
and maybe let's call it two generations, so 20 years from now, you will not be able to ascertain who is actually in the room and who is being digitally projected into the room. The fidelity of those experiences will be so incredibly good. And in fact, people during this transition, we're going to use two-dimensional computing uh, as a metaphor for that new transition. But that will be as silly as it has done every other time we've transitioned technology, right? So imagine with me the following scenario. Let's say you're an Apple loyalist. Let's say that you have an Apple Watch, you have an iPhone, you have an iPad, you have an Apple TV, you're logged in across those systems. But then one day, you walk into the Apple store and you're given a pair of designer spectacles. Uh, you don't happen to be wearing your Apple Watch that day, but it's crazy. When you log on and you put these glasses on, it appears like you're wearing the exact model of Apple Watch that you actually own. So you're like, oh, that's weird, and it tracks to your wrist perfectly. Um, but then, as you're interacting, you see there's a button that looks like a little iPhone. And you push that button and pshh, an iPhone of zero ounces appears in your hand. And you can interact with it exactly as you do because the, he the hand tracking is coming from the HMD. So you interact with it just like you would an iPhone, um, except it's kind of cool because when you play Pokemon Go, of course you can do this, but when you take the phone away, the Pokemon is there because you also have three dimensions, right? And then uh, you get to a New York Times article, and you push the New York Times article, and now there's an impossibly large tablet in your hand that's attached perfectly to your hand with perfect resolution. And then you stumble across a video in that article, and you're with a colleague who's also wearing Apple glasses. You push play, and you project that into a virtual screen on the wall that you can both observe. Now, that little pantomime that I just walked through, that is plagued by all this intellectual baggage that we have because we spent the last 50 years computing in two dimensions. It's exactly the same thing as when motion pictures were invented. The first you know, motion pictures just filmed people on stage because that was the only creative intellectual context that we had. So I'm here to say that in this new revolution of computing, immersive computing, which includes AR, VR, MR, XR, Alphabet soup it includes all of it. Immersive computing is going to be about space. It's going to be about architecture, is user interface as architecture. And in this way, you at this conference and in this room, um, the agents of chaos, as Chris says, are, are the best suited to invent this new world together. Um, so let me... Um, uh, let me uh, move forward and, um, and sort of talk a little bit about um, my background very, very quickly. So it's crazy to say, but I've been working in AR and VR for more than 20 years. Um, so I worked on uh, uh, the deployment and demo team for the first ever consumer VR system in the world back in 1994. That was called Disney Vision. I was an employee of the Walt Disney Company at the time. Um, uh, I did not build that system, but I was on the deployment team. It was radically advanced. It was an Aladdin magic carpet experience, four users at a time, simultaneous, stereoscopic. The HMD weighed about 35 pounds, but it was suspended from the ceiling um, to, to distribute that weight. It was uh, $250,000 US per eye. Um, so one SGI reality engine per eye. So you do the math on a, on a, on a four user system. Um, and then uh, from there, I joined Microsoft Research in 1999, where I was responsible for worldwide academic research funding in the domain of augmented reality, funded some super interesting projects, one of which was uh, Columbia University, uh, Dr. Stephen Finer and his team. Uh, this is actually the system before the one that uh, we funded, but you, know, you can tell this is a very early AR system with a GPS tower <laughs> mounted to a laptop on a backpack and very low quality generation one glasses. But even then, the magic of projecting digital information accurately over top of the real world. It was evident how transformative that was. Um, so um, wh where I thought I would start quickly, and I assume that most of you in this room are already experimenting with VR and you're already in the AR and VR headspace, literally and figuratively, but just as a top line overview, this is how I kind of contextualize the space. You have the high price, high presence systems in the orange boxes. Some of them use inside out tracking. Some of them use outside in tracking. Um, you have the, um, a new generation of self-contained Android powered kind of inside out tracking HMDs that do not require an external compute system. That's the purple rectangle. Um, I continue to be quite passionate about mobile VR because sometimes the goal is not presence, but the goal is scale. You want to get as many people into a VR experience as possible. In this way, I'll say that my favorite device this five minutes is the Homido Mini. Beautiful optics, tiny little device, costs $10 on Amazon, and allows you to be able to convert any iPhone from any manufacturer and any platform into a surprisingly good uh, kind 
kind of VR headset. But of course, um, AR is where we're all headed, the green box on the right. And in fact, this year will represent a very significant shift in VR because uh, both the Quest and the HoloLens 2 launches. Um, I have had a chance to get eyes on the new HoloLens 2 at, Redmond's, at Microsoft's Redmond campus. And um, I'm pretty desensitized to these technology demos, as many of you are. I'll go on record saying it's the single most impressive technical demo I've ever had. It's, it's the weight of a baseball cap because it's all carbon fiber. The field of view is not, I think, as good as any of us would want it, but it's impressively better uh, than its predecessor, importantly. Um, and it has incredible hand tracking uh, at frame rate, and the, uh, and the gaze tracking is science fiction. Uh, very, very high quality mobile gaze tracking. So um, that device is going to ship this calendar year and has the potential, I think, to be kind of the iPhone 1.0, at least for the enterprise. They're not intending it for consumers. It's $3,500, but it will be an important uh, and impactful device, uh, I believe, in this, in this ecosystem. And especially to this audience, in 2019, I could never talk about trends in VR um, without showing you um, uh, this one, <laughs> the Nintendo Labo. So it's my belief that the best Nintendo is the weirdest Nintendo, and this is definitely an example of that. So you take your Switch, you put it in this contraption, a combination of, of uh, cardboard and plastic, sort of in, you know, inspired by Google's early work in, in Google Cardboard, but um, actually brings in these different expressions, including the ability to draw in 3D with an elephant trunk or have a face cannon or flap like a bird and fly. Very interesting and trippy experiences, but I, I think just, just a little bit of an eyedropper of how this new world of, imme of immersive computing will bring forth new creative expression. Okay. I do want to talk about software that's used to author this because um, I'm primarily focused on productivity workflows in, uh, in construction and other 3D industries. And um, there's many ways to create 3D content, but I just want to state that for our purposes, the vast majority of what we see in terms of endpoints for VR is Revit Rhino SketchUp. Um, you know, a little bit of Max, a little bit of Maya, you know, a, a tiny bit of ArchiCAD and, and others, but generally speaking, it's Revit Rhino SketchUp. That's where the content comes from, which is why I massively celebrate having this kind of lingua franca to be able to do consistently awesome, easy, efficient renders across all these systems. And that's better now than ever with V-Ray Next and cloud rendering. This is an important shift in the way that, our t that we think about our tool chain for this category. Um, so we're honored to be here at this conference. We're honored to sponsor, and um, we've, we've as, as before, been constantly impressed with the execution of the Chaos Group on this product. Um, I also want to call out this trend because I think it's an awesome and important trend, which is uh, which I call immersive authoring or immersive creation. So. You know, to date, most of the content that you experience in VR is created not in VR. But there's a whole menagerie of immersive tools, um, uh, all starting with Google um, uh, Tilt Brush, but Google Blocks is a sort of a, a, a modeling, a, a variant of that. Gravity Sketch, some of you might use in your workflow. Microsoft Maquette, which is now in beta, just shipped last month. And uh, the one I'm most excited, actually, is a PlayStation Dreams, which is this really elegant, responsive design model where you can do immersive 3D creation all the way down from just a PlayStation 4 with a screen and a, and a, a DualShock controller all the way up to uh, a PlayStation VR with, uh, with PlayStation Move controllers and any combination therein. And it actually allows not only 3D modeling and painting, but it also allows animation, basic scripting, um, a, a music authoring in VR, a, a incredibly ambitious effort from Media Molecule. Ships in the next month, I am giddy with anticipation, not only to spend time in it, but also to observe um, what creates creators do with a tool like that. So this is a trend worth noting. Okay, this is a good transition to talk a little bit about my research over the course of the last, um, uh, of the last four years. And of course, it's important to say that it's, it's not actually my research, it's their research. So this is our team back in Seattle, Washington. You can see us posing at different stages of the Amazon uh, biospheres, which are an amazing architectural project. And the reason why we have this repeated project is because the biospheres are on the way walking from our office to the, uh, the Cinerama. So every time there's a new Marvel movie, we close the 
the office. We walk there. We take a picture in front of the spheres, and we go watch the movie. Uh, so this is our team. The work that you're about to see is not my work. It's their incredible effort together with my co-founder, Sean B. House. Um, so um, uh, before I talk a little bit about this effort, um, as Chris mentioned, we're going we're gonna to do a bit of an experiment, uppercase E. So, um, uh, so I, what I would have you do is if you, if you haven't already done so and you want to participate in the experience, number one, I, I recommend you turn Wi-Fi off. Very important. Um, regardless of the fidelity of the Wi-Fi in the room, uh, the reality is that we're going to be pulling a bunch of data down. We're going to attempt a large-scale VR experience. So um, cellular actually will have lower latency, but that's okay. It'll have better bandwidth per tower. So let's, uh, let's do that. Unless you absolutely have to use Wi-Fi, if you don't have a data plan, then you can do it. But otherwise, I highly recommend you use cellular. You'll have a better experience. We're optimized for cellular because of construction job sites. So you will have a better experience. The second thing is install visual vocal, just like it sounds, from your favorite app store, two blue triangles, install the app. The third thing is you're going to need to enable microphone access. It is a meeting platform, so um, thank you in advance for trusting us and saying accept on both Android and iPhone. If you have super strong feelings about that, we can get you in uh, anyway, but, but it's, it's much cooler if you enable mic access. Again, your experience will be better. So Visual Vocal was born out of this insight that there's a bunch of people that are doing cool things around uh, visualization in AR and VR. Um, and, you know, Chaos Group and others will always be better at that than we'll ever uh, imagine being. But we observed, my co-founder and I, that there was a missing gap around this notion of immersive communication, really thinking about how to how do humans communicate in these immersive contexts? So we really double clicked on that. Imagine with me if there was something equivalent to like a PDF of VR, something that was a super lightweight cloud-based object that could include captures and renders and ink markup and voice annotation all in one object that could be easily shared. So that was the vision of Visual Vocal, hence the name. Uh, so I thought for this audience in particular, it might be cool to talk about our creative process, about how we landed in this specific um, a technical solution. So the first three pillars that we dissected is we wanted to observe the way that humans communicate around three-dimensional space today. So other VR productivity systems pick a use case, follow people around in that job, uh, job function, whether they're an architect or a construction foreman or an electrical engineer, and they build a solution for them. Our solution instead was to observe the way that humans communicate around immersive content. And we boiled it down to these very specific pivots. Number one, you have to support both synchronous and asynchronous communication. So there are meetings where you're all at the same time, maybe different places in a space in a space, but then there's also asynchronous communication because many of these billion dollar skyscrapers are taking place across time zones. The investors in one region, the developers in another region, the architects in a different region. It's very, very important to be able to connect these people together using asynchronous communication, the same exact user flow that you would use in a synchronous meeting. So we did that. Number two, AR and VR, and instead of getting caught up in the technical implementation, is this augmented reality or virtual reality technology, instead we thought about the context. Is this experience happening in situ on the job site where you want to overlay digital information over top of the real world, or is it happening um, in a remote location? And the same content will often cross that that uh, uh, that transom. The last piece is um, unbuilt geometries and built content or captured content. This was my biggest surprise, actually. My expectation is that on a productivity system, the vast majority of content would actually be renders from a model or from CAD. But in fact, about 50% of the content that flows through our system um, it actually comes from uh, stereoscopic photospheres or baby light fields from the actual job site, which is cool, a cool insight. And they use this for time travel or teleportation, remote expert applications. Um, so. Now, what are the actual use cases? What would you use Visual Vocal for? Again, rather than like selling a very specific enterprise use case, the thing that we try to sell is human superpowers. So teleportation, time travel, x-ray vision, and mind merge, um, which is 
almost exactly like the Vulcan mind meld, um, but you don't have to be an alien, and it doesn't have a Paramount trademark, um, so <laughs> like mind meld does. So anyways, the, the notion here is that using this array of technology, um, you know, think how useful that is. You want to be able to teleport to a job site and have remote presence, or you want to be able to teleport a structural engineer to your job site instantly in two minutes. Um, time travel is I want to be standing here, and I want to see what this project is going to look like in a week based on the model, or even look at what it looked like a week ago based on progress documentation with spherical photography. Um, or I want to, after the project is done and occupied, I want to actually look behind the walls and see where the pipes are. Not where the drawing says the pipes are, but where the subcontractor actually placed the pipes, which is almost never the same thing. So, um, so very, very powerful. And then mind merge, the ability to share a noggin and actually interact in that, in that way. On the other side of the, of the spectrum is uh, our methodology. So uh, over the course of the last 10 years, we have, a, as a community, have developed this notion of responsive design, it, you know, applied generally to web and app technologies. We should be applying that same design philosophy to AR and VR because people might, you know, might use a, a, a mobile device or they might use a tablet, they might use stereoscopic, they might use monoscopic, they might use an HMD, and you need to have that organic um, kind of transition across all those. Um, the next thing is we want um, to, we pr predominantly use pre-rendered content. And in fact, even as we transition from three degrees of freedom to six degrees of freedom, we still plan on using pre-rendered content, which is why I loved Paul's talk on light fields so much yesterday. We've been tracking uh, light fields very, very closely as a technology because it allows you to have total control over the visual fidelity and use whatever tool chain you want. Just render it in V-Ray, um, and then you can have either a 3DOF or 6DOF experience that, again, is responsive based on the hardware of the device that you're using. Um, so that's, that's a different direction. It also means you don't have to worry about model reduction, tessellation, geometry uh, uh, ex uh, extraction, et cetera. The, the second thing is fast authoring. And when I say fast authoring, we actually mean light speed authoring. You should be able to make one of these files in two minutes, either from V-Ray or from the real world. And from the real world, you should be able to do it from your phone without even touching a computer. We now have shipped both those features. And then the last thing is visual and vocal. So maybe the most powerful insight that we developed during our research phase is that the highest bandwidth method of human communication is not video. It's actually talking while pointing. So, hey, that conduit's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be over there. Like, that's a very high bandwidth method. So we put, took tremendous care and filed some significant patents around how to recreate inking and p talking while pointing in a highly scalable technology-mediated uh, uh, medium. Now, this thing, this object that is created that leverages all this technology, we call that a VV. And a VV is an abbreviation for the company name Visual Vocal, um, but colloquially, you would use it exactly the way you would use the term PDF. Like, hey, you know what, we have a, we have a meeting in five minutes. I'm just going to throw together a VV so we can show this in VR. Or, um, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I know you're on the job site. Can you just make a VV and send it to me? Um, we'll jump in there together. That is how we want people to think about this content. It's a new uh, species of content, if you will. Unlike a PDF, though, it's really more like a Google Doc. It's a cloud-based multi-user object um, that allows uh, simultaneous editing. OK. So I know that's a little bit of sensory overload, but, um, but we're almost ready for a quick demo. If a picture is worth a 1,000 words, a VR experience is worth a 1,000 pictures. But in conclusion, I would just say to kind of capture your imagination, come back to these human superpowers. Um, and the beautiful thing about these superpowers, teleportation, time travel, x-ray vision, and mind merge, is that those are expressed at different phases of a construction uh, or, or engineering project. Um, you can very easily imagine when these different things are used. And our first wave of customers um, actually has expressed this technology at different phases. So sometimes it's used for the pursuit phase. Sometimes it's used for construction or architecture. And sometimes it's used for own off, uh, owner handoff and, and owner training. Um, and we have an incredible menagerie of partners that are using it in many different ways. Um, if you saw the Woods Bagot talk yesterday, Taryn is amazing, and his team was actually one of the earliest to use visual vocal at scale. And he'll actually join me on stage and show you some of his content in a moment. OK, so at this point, you might be thinking, how in the heck is this dude going to get 250 people, I don't know, there's probably at least 150 here, um, into VR at the same time together? Uh, so this is particularly cool. I have my phone here. It's on cellular. 
and um, I, since I'm logged into the VV cloud, then I'm just going to go into my VVs. And last night, I threw together a cool VV that I want to show you. This sort of has a whole um, a biodiversity of content, not just from Woods Bagot, but from some of our, our other customers. And um, the way that I'm going to get us all connected actually uses a unique technology from our business partner, Chirp. Um, it's an audio watermarking technology, and it allows me to be able to spin up one of these VVs. So I'm going to do that now. And, um, and so now it's spinning up this, uh, this, this VV session, and it's spinning up a cloud session. And what I'm going to have you do is launch the Visual Vocal app on your phone, and I want you to hold up your phone concert style facing me. So just hold it up. I should look out and see a bunch of these uh, text entry fields. Now, you might be wondering why there's a Tetris block on our home screen. That's actually a seven-digit entry field. Every VV is described by a seven-digit alphanumeric code. And I'm going to pull you guys all into this VV using this Chirp technology in three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to hit it again. Most of you got it. Look at your phones. It's rad. Here it comes. Three, two, one. Looks like we've got 100%. Um, pretty, pretty killer. Um, so it's going to start downloading content. And in fact, if for some reason um, it did not successfully download, or if you chose not to give us microphone access, here's the seven-digit VV. And you might just want to glance and verify that that's the one that it heard and, heard and picked up. Um, but um, what we're going to do is we're actually all going to join in together. So once it, once it loads, I invite you to go ahead and, uh, and say join meeting. And, um, you know, I, it's funny, this is a multi-user VR session, but of course we're going to do this Pokemon Go style, kind of monoscopic, because we don't have 250 VR headsets, but you'll kind of get the point. Yeah, what's that? Okay, uh, but this, this is a 3D crowd. So know, they, they, I mean, they don't, don't want to see things in mono, so we have to give them in stereo. But, but we, how are we going to give them 250 VR headsets in the middle of the session? <sighs> okay, hold on. Um, uh, look underneath your chair. <laughs> there's, just, there's probably something there that we could help. There you go. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a special thank you to the Chaos Group for the heroic logistical effort to actually, we, we, you know, we got here uh, early this morning to sort of pre-stage the room with VR viewers. And also a special thank you to Hamido, um, who, in support of you, the, the, the agents of Chaos community, has actually contributed at $10 a piece uh, these VR viewers so we could all experience this in VR. So pretty rad. And you can see, um, I'm actually going to switch HDMI sources, and you'll see that you're all popping into the VV meeting um, one at a time, which is pretty killer. So um, I'm going to plug this into my phone, and you'll see that pop up in about five seconds. And then you'll see that there's a, yeah, this is great. It's perfect. I have a bunch of people that are, that are connecting. Look at that. So right on my phone, over cellular and Wi-Fi, we're all bloop, 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 look, everybody's flying into, into this VR session. We're all in there together, which is pretty cool. And once you put the viewers on, you should be standing on a construction job site. This is actually the newest skyscraper in Seattle, Washington. Um, and um, this is a job site, so you should be seeing that. But here's the cool thing, is I'm actually going to enter the meeting with you. So I'm in monoscopic mode, just so that you can see it easily. So is this the scene that you guys are seeing? Just uh, give me a thumbs up if you guys are seeing this scene. Okay, but here's the cool thing. We're actually all in this VV together. And remember how I talked about talking while pointing? We actually invented this new inking method where you draw with your targeting reticle. So the whole screen is one big button. And me as the host, I hold down my finger. And as I hold down my finger, I can actually move my targeting reticle. And you guys will see me inking on your screens. Do you see that right now? So, so we're basically in this shared session. You can already realize the, the usefulness and efficiency of being able to do shared multi-user inking, right? But now check this out. Do you guys see this hot spot right here that I'm highlighting in, in VR? Okay, so this is a hot spot that we call a time travel hot spot. So I'm actually going to pop that open. And you'll see that open, and you'll see that there's actually two captures of this job site. One from this week and one from last week. So I'm actually going to time travel the entire group um, back in time by one week in three, two, one. Here we go. 
So, so these are both um, stereoscopic photospheres powered by Google's VR180 technology. $250 phone from Lenovo, or a camera from Lenovo, that can capture an incredibly good little baby light field um, with left eye and right eye. And so I can very quickly do progress documentation or ask a question about this. Now, everything you're seeing being done synchronously can also be done asynchronously across time zones. So I could say verbally, um, dude, what is this thing right here? And as I do that, it would capture my voice and inking so when I send the VV to somebody, they, open, they, wake it, they wake up on their time zone and open it, they'll hear my voice and see my inking. Okay, let's teleport together into the model. So if you look down on the floor, there's this little, um, we call it the floor menu, and I'm gonna take us into the model in three, two, one. Okay, so now, if you look up using these viewers, you get a surprisingly good uh, human scale of a tower in front of you. And um, this hotspot right here is what we call an optioneering hotspot. So when I pop that open, you can see there's been three different renders of this scene. And all that changed was the structure. So this is a beautiful way to be able to do uh, architectural optioneering. So here, these cross bracings right here, they're color coded purple for every one floor. Uh, we also did a study where they're color-coded orange where cross bracings are every three floors. I'm going to fade that in in three, two, one. So now we all see it together and we can have a conversation. Um, and then cross bracing every ten floors or six floors. Cool, right? All right, now the next scene I'm going to show you is um, if you look up here, you can see that there's a teleporter. So I'm going to take us into the building. And this is a beautiful V-Ray render of the interior of the building. Look down. Oh. You get a good sense of scale? Don't jump. You have too much to live for. Um, pretty cool. Um, this is an, another optioneering uh, hotspot. In fact, if you look at the entourage across the room, um, then I can actually turn on this gold acoustic screen. And we did one render with it, one render without it, alpha fade between them, tracking head movement, and it's really nice kind of real-time uh, architectural visualization. Everybody seeing that on their phones? Sweet. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you one last scene before handing it over to Woods Baggett for a dump for a, actually you're the first to see Taryn's newest VV, which is pretty rad. So if you, we're in Brooklyn now, as you might tell. There's the Manhattan Bridge above us. And then this is uh, the Brooklyn Bridge off to the left. This was part of an uh, urban planning uh, study done by the Never Built Group. So they look at the most ambitious projects in any urban city that were conceived but never built. And this was a partnership with, um, with many great innovators, in, including uh, Sam LaBelle and Greg Golden, but also um, uh, the Shimahar Illustration team that actually generated this VV. So this is a capture. And now, um, in 1925, Raymond Hood proposed that both the, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge be turned into skyscrapers. So. Fortunately, that never happened, but you can see uh, the one above us and the one off in the distance. Those are both skyscrapers, um, so that's kind of a cool feature. Um, Taryn, do you want to come on stage and show, uh, show a little bit about this lighting study? This is super rad. You'll have to come up here. <laughs> oh, uh, maybe I'll just... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank and you. Then, and then you can ink just by smashing your phone. So, first of all, John, this is an awesome presentation. <laughs> uh, we, we love using visual vocal tools, you know. It's, it just gives us this opportunity to talk while we're all working remotely, be it on-site, be it design. But we have this opportunity to design something. This isn't going to be the building, but... This is the potential of the site. And looking around, we're in the heart of the city of London. And if and, anyone and knows the and heritage Woodbeck here. actually modeled uh, London to be able to do this lighting and, and view study, which is pretty rad. Shout out to the team that modeled even the new tulip. Now, do you see that? There's the hot spot right in front of you, actually yep. off to the left. But uh, actually, the purpose of the study is about finding the issues around this building. There's no one from Raphael Vinolia here, is there? That's good to hear. Formally. But <laughs> this building, um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with, but the walkie-talkie. So this, this guy, and because of its curvature, 
actually started burning cars. You know, light rays would um, reflect on the concave structure and start burning things down here. So as a result, before we approach any design, you know, we've got to look at all the conditions, including you know, what the solar penetration of the site's going to be. We can see the scalpel here. Crazy. They must be very, very hot in there. This study is obviously cheating a little bit because it doesn't take into consideration the internal con concave reflection rays. This is the first direct ray, but it gives us this opportunity to see what the solar exposure of this site and the potential of it's going to be. Sweet. Awesome, cool. Taryn. So Thanks. this shows an example of the reason why I love this pre-rendered approach, and again, the reason why I'm such a fan of V-Ray as, as an authoring solution for this, um, is that you can do whatever you want to. We're not limited to the tool chain. So your team wanted to do a lighting study, just bake those as renders or visualizations or run a computational design study, and that can be visualized in VV. So I'm going to do one last thing, which is I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting, and you'll all get a message on your phones that says the meeting has ended, but you're free to look around, and I've now virally infected each of you with this VV. So under your My VVs on your home screen, even though you're not a subscriber to Visual Vocal, you can actually revisit this content, and I've also stored some voice notes before this meeting in some of those scenes that you can look for and listen to. I would ask that you uh, come out of VR now. It's funny, the hardest part of these presentations is getting people out of VR, which is a good sign. And the reason why I'm a believer in this as a transformative potential. But uh, Taryn, thank you so much for contributing. I'm glad you were able to uh, share that. Um, so what you just saw was this: the anatomy of a VV is basically it's multiple different um, photospheres. Uh, these were a mix of mono and stereo, a mix of captures and renders um, from different tools. Uh, the system doesn't care, um, can process all seven standard uh, global standards. And then within each one of these scenes, you can have multiple hotspots. Each one of these hotspots can actually have multiple variations. The difference between a scene and a variation is a variation doesn't move the camera. So you can easily have different design studies. And then we do this uh, kind of talk plus pointing method where it captures your inking synchronized with your voice. So it's a very efficient way. Now, I will mention that if we didn't have 250 people in a VV together, there's a checkbox on my console that allows me to turn on color-coded inking for everyone. In which case, you know, when you're doing a typical meeting where you have maybe five people, maybe 20 people, it's actually super useful that everybody can ink and everybody sees each other's ink. And that works perfectly, but not for 250 people. Uh, so um, it would be just kindergarten explosion. So, um, but, uh, but it's very cool, and if you, if you tinker with VV, you can try that. So um, every VV has a seven-digit code. You can share a VV with one person asynchronously or host it for, there's a new record, apparently more than 200 people simultaneously. We also have uh, opened up a standard in the way that we actually now have a Unity SDK. So as a paid subscriber, you can actually build your own app that can host and join VV meetings or uh, receive VV messages using our, uh, authored using our web console. Um, so uh, we actually have the first wave of customers that are parting on this SDK now. The first in market is the official app for HOK. Uh, that's live in the App Store now. You can tinker with it. It'll look really familiar in terms of the user flow will be identical to what you just experienced. But instead of blue ink, it'll be red ink because that's their brand. And it's, it's monoscopic by default instead of stereoscopic because that's their preference. The visual language is totally different. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not pre presenting. Uh, let me switch over. Um, sorry, three, two, one. There we go. Perfect. So these are examples of those apps. Um, it's just a general purpose Unity SDK. You can do whatever you want to with it. I want to take a moment and talk a little bit about where we're investing. What is our current roadmap? So um, again, captures are super important. I'm a huge fan of the Google Cardboard Camera app. It's the best way to quickly generate a stereoscopic photosphere. About 20 seconds with about 7 seconds of post-processing for a 180 degree stereoscopic sphere. That's totally rad. It does automatic gain adjustment, automatic stitching, and everything. And um, I've used this phrase that 180 greater than 360. Another best practice we've learned is that a 180-degree capture, or render actually, is, can be more useful than a 360-degree capture for communication because it focuses the gaze of the participant um, 
it decreases your file size by half of the VV, so it makes it faster. But then it also means that it's easier to generate a stereoscopic image, like using a, a VR180 camera. Uh, so I'm big, a big fan of the Cardboard Capture app. We actually support it natively in Visual Vocals. So you can do a capture, create a VV from your phone, publish it, and share it, or host a meeting, never touching a computer and never leaving the job site. That's our newest feature. Um, the last thing is uh, what we're working on now is we have a new product, which is, um, I like to describe it as kind of low-tech solutions to high-tech problems. So because every VV is uniquely described by a seven-digit alphanumeric, we've sort of conceived of this unique text entry field as you found, but then we also have this job site kit, and everybody on a job site has a Sharpie. So you take one of this, kind of post-it note 2.0, you write in the numbers, and we are... Um, uh, we've actually now completed the work on a very high performance machine render or machine recognizer. So the notion is that you can make a VV, you can write it, you can stick it on the on the floorboard, and now somebody knows there's a little piece of user interface in the real world that communicates that a VV lives there. And our HoloLens product, which comes out later this year, is magical because the user interface is nothing. You just walk into a space, you look for a VVID tag, you gaze upon the VVID tag, it will load that VV in the cloud just like you experienced, and now you're standing back in time in that location, or standing in the model of that location. And we call that experience a productive hallucination. You're basically standing there, you hear the voice of the creator, you see their inking, and you travel back in time. Um, the, um, so the, uh, the last thing is, as I mentioned, we're super bullish about the transformative potential of light fields from Google and others um, because we still are bullish about the notion of pre-rendered content, but we do need to move into six degrees of freedom, and we're doing a lot of the engineering work to figure out how a VV format can scale up and down on 3DOF and 6DOF and can support that.